this was a fun one. I am excited to release this episode, which it... This was a fun one. I'm excited to release this episode, which was a conversation between myself and the legendary Shep Gordon. Legendary is not hyperbolic in this case. Um, Shep is an infamous music manager. He's well known as an understatement, but he's well known in the music industry for managing Alice Cooper. He still manages Alice Cooper. Blondie, Teddy, Teddy Pendergrass, Luther Vandross, Groucho Marx, Pink Floyd, the list goes on. Rick James, it's it's ridiculous. Um, so one of the the best music managers, most illustrated music managers in the history of the, the music business. Furthermore, um, he single in the words of Emerald Lagasse, he single handedly created sub- celebrity chefs. Um, he managed Emerald Lagasse, Dean Faring, uh, Jonathan Waxman, all, tons of Wolfgang Puck, tons of famous chefs. He managed their careers and is responsible for them being celebrities and for there even being such thing as a celebrity chef um, was sort of his idea. Furthermore, he's produced countless films um, and to really get a good idea of Shep, if you are intrigued by this this episode, this conversation, which I'm sure you will be, um, there's a documentary about Shep. It's called Supermensch, and it was directed by Mike Myers. Um, and in this film, you can actually see where this conversation took place. Shep's home in Maui is infamous in the entertainment industry for being sort of a sanctuary for celebrities who are sort of over overwhelmed um shep takes care of people and he invites them to maui and they can just sort of he lets them stay at his house and cool off for you know as, as long as they need to and we reached out to shep to see if he would be on the podcast um very grateful that he accepted and he invited uh my love and i to my love Megan and I to stay at his house so we got to stay at the house in Maui for a night and this conversation took place on his back porch as we watched the sunset over the Pacific Ocean Um, it was gorgeous to say the least and an incredible conversation as well I hope you enjoy this is Shep Gordon on what does this all mean Shep, sir. Aloha. <laughs> the legendary. <laughs> we are here at your beautiful is an understatement. <laughs> your serene, peaceful home. Thank which you. You've yeah. Opened up to us. Um, so I want to thank you for my, having me here. My pleasure to have you. I feel more like a caretaker than an owner. So I this love sharing it. It really. That's sort of what it's for. This may, maybe that's a good place to start off. You seem to effortlessly be an impeccable host. <laughs> I enjoy ser- serving. And wha- uh, what are the elements? Was that always the case for you? Um, I think in some ways always the case, but I wasn't really aware of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some ways... Um, saw it myself and was perceived by my community as a weakness rather than a strength. Mm. So it was sort of something that I didn't bring to the surface. Um, and then I got very lucky to, to, to get some mentors in my life who got their joy through service. Who were those people? Um, first was a chef by the name of Roger Berger. Uh, Mr. Berger was one of the chefs who invented Nouveau Cuisine, which was sort of like saying he invented the blues in music. It's sort of what everything is based on. Wow. Um, <laughs> he's like the Chuck Berry. Of, How uh, old is he? He passed away a few years ago. He would have been Sorry for your loss. 87, 88 now. Mm-hmm. Um, but a beautiful, beautiful man who, who um, was very focused at his joy. He came through service. Um, and then I had the unbelievable uh, luck to be able to spend some time in the in the approximate area of his holiness 
Yes. And um, the Dalai Lama. Yeah, the Dalai Lama, and to see um, his joy through service was just beautiful, and it sort of tied together all the the words growing up that I sort of perceived as lies, which were the religions, because they didn't practice it. Mm. So you know you would you you'd be told about being service and being kind to your neighbor and being compassionate, um, but no one for me at least provided any roadmap and what i saw was completely the opposite coming out of the the where the wisdom for service traditionally should be coming from which is religions um they just you know um having to buy a ticket for the high holy day services as a jewish kid yeah and my parents not wanting to go because they couldn't afford the good tickets I, w- I wanted to ask you yeah. about y- specifically what, if any, your spirituality looked like as a child. Um, and sort of set uh, the scenes for us. Where are you as a well, kid? Well, it's interesting. It's up? an interesting question because I never really, I never thought about it. Um, I spent a lot of time alone as a child. Um and always thought, and I, I, I think I had good thoughts, but I wasn't, I, I didn't think about those things. I I was forced to go to uh, get my bar mitzvah. Um, I didn't like the way I was being taught. I didn't, it didn't feel comfortable to me, this. Um, was whim- it a conservative film? Yeah, it was, it, it, it started conservative and went to reform, but the first one was women and men in separate sides, mm-hmm. which blew my mind. Um, Where'd you grow up? Oceanside, Long okay. Island. Hearing uh, ever early on that uh, we went to a wedding, there was a Jew and a non-Jew, and I was told that rabbis wouldn't do weddings with Jews and non-Jews. I thought, boy, that's weird. So it goes against everything that I read that they say. Um, so, um, I I never thought about it in terms of my first, I would say my first touch of awareness, um, was, I was probably in my early twenties. I went to, um, Thailand with Mr. Berger, my first trip. With Mr. Berger. How old are you at this on this trip? I'd say I'm 25, 26. Okay. I'm um, way too successful. You know, I'm, I'm I'm living that dream, that Hollywood dream. You What's know? going on in your life at the I, time? I um, have a managing Alice Cooper, Groucho Marx, Raquel Welsh, Blondie, Anne Murray. Um, I just won a Cannes Film Festival, my first picture. Um, I had the hot nightclub in L.A. I was driving a white Rolls Royce. I had cocaine, gold cocaine spoons around my neck. <laughs> I was, uh, you know. What is that? Is that like a, like it's a little yeah. container? No, just a spoon, a out? gold spoon so you could. Oh, so yeah. just the. the it was your, cool. Everybody wore, you know, the, the cool guys <laughs> had a Tiffany spoon. And <laughs> Tiffany and Cartier would sell the spoons. They didn't call it Coke spoons. What did they call it? I don't remember what they called it, but. <laughs> Um, and I remember I had a, uh, from Cartier, a Cuban cigar band pinky ring. <laughs> <laughs> I was way too cool. I was, you know, I got married to a playmate for a minute. Um, but I, I, I sort of knew I was getting ready for a crash. You know, I could see enough to see that. And, uh, but I was enjoying every second in the moment. But I knew that. It was fool's gold and sort of kind of enjoyment. And uh, then I met the chef, and he just seemed like he could take me to where I thought I wanted to go. Tell me about the first time you met. Uh, he walked into the, I was in um, I was in the south of France. I had just won the Cannes Film Festival with my first movie, a movie called The Duelist, uh, Ridley Scott's first movie. Wow. And, um, and what was your role in the film? I was the executive producer and got financier. Uh, but I didn't have to finance it. I got Paramount Pictures to finance it. Got it. And um, David Putnam produced it, who's now Sir David Putnam. Um, and um, 
I got taken to this restaurant by Paramount Pictures, who was the distributor for winning the festival. We went to this restaurant called the Moulin des Moujan, up in the mountains outside of Cannes. And um, when I walked in, it was like the Hollywood Wax Museum, except they were living. You know, James Coburn, Anthony Quinn, Pavarotti, Barbara Streisand, um, on and on and on and on. But nobody seemed really comfortable in their skin. <laughs> Everybody was sort of looking around the room rather than at the people at their table. A lot of knees were going up and down, that nervous knee thing. Yeah. Um, in those, <laughs> in, that sometimes. Yeah, in those days, you could... S- you smoke. You could smoke in restaurants. People smoking, so a little sweaty. Um, and I started thinking to myself, I'm, I'm sort of becoming one of them. I'm right on track. Mm. And is that really where I want to go? Um, and then this beautiful man walked in the room, in a white, all in white, and white hair and big smile. And the room got very silent. And James Coburn jump, jumped up and went over and hugged him, and then. Anthony Quinn hugged. Everybody was like, uh, he changed the vibe of the room completely. He was obviously, he was the power structure. Um, just by walking in. Just by walking in, place, the whole vibe of the place changed. Um, and he sort of held court. And, um, and I said to myself, that's who I want to be. So I've always been intrigued by power. Um, power and fame have always um, really intrigued me. I'm always drawn to it, sort of like a mosquito in light. Um, and usually there's something to be gained. There's a reason why people got to those positions. So there's, I have found there's some, usually something exciting and something to be gained about, you know, if you can jump on their journey for a little bit. Um, so I waited till service was over and I, I, worked my way into his life and the first trip I took with him which was the following year was to Thailand well how did you work your way in his life um, I went over to, I waited until service was over and I went over to him and I um, I asked him if he had seen this show called Kung Fu and uh, he said no and I said well I want to be your grasshopper in Kung Fu there's so an old master right away. and a grass yeah and he said what is this grasshopper and I said, well, you know, I just, I want to be, w- I would like to be with you. And he said, do you cook? And he didn't speak English very well. And I said, no, I don't. And so if you learn to cook, I will let you work in the kitchen with me for a day. So I s- asked him how I learned to cook. And he gave me, he wrote down the names of uh, two cooking schools, uh, Marcella Hansen in Italy, Bologna, Italy, and one other one. And I went to both schools and came back the next year. And went in the restaurant and said, I'm here. <laughs> and he had no idea who I was. I mean, no <laughs> idea. <laughs> and where where was this restaurant you went to? This, uh, south of France, same one. Okay. Yeah, he only had one restaurant. So in, in the, the time when he walked in the room, he was cooking. F- was he the chef that he night? He was a chef, but it's his restaurant. Got it. Um, it was a three-star Michelin restaurant. So in France, he was very famous. He already had the Legion of Honor on his lapel. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was the revered feeding place in the world. You know, there were always Japanese taking pictures. And, um, so um, I, went, I, I went, and he always, you know, he was the place to go during the film festival. I had a movie the next year in the film festival. I came back and showed up and said, okay, I'm here. I went to the cooking schools and he had no idea. And I said, well, you said I could work in the kitchen for a day. Can I work in the kitchen for a day? And he said, I'm so sorry, I'm going to Bangkok. Um, tomorrow, and I said, "What well, can I come with you to Bangkok?" And he looked at me like I was completely insane. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "But if uh, if you would like to, yes." Uh, do, do, do. So anyway, I went to Bangkok. He told me where he was staying and where he was cooking, and I checked into the hotel. And um, I remember the first night was very funny. He said, "Do you have a tuxedo?" And I said, "No." And he said, you must get a tuxedo. I sent someone to your room in Bangkok. They make a tuxedo in an hour. (laughs) And we had dinner that night with Princess Serena of Malaysia, (laughs) which was so out of my sphere. Um, But um, in the drawer of the hotel, where normally a Bible would be, was a a book uh, on Buddhism, uh, whatever they call their prayer book. 
and I had a lot of time. It was before I discovered Ambien, so sometimes sleep didn't mm. come so fast. So I started reading the book, but I, it was hard for me to absorb it. When I came back home, it really interested me. It got something in the book sort of talked to me a little bit. So I emailed a friend of mine from college, and I asked him if he knew about Buddhism, and he said he had ended up teaching about Buddhism. And I said, tell me about it. And he wrote me like a 15-page tryst on Buddhism. And the last paragraph was, now you can rip this up and forget it. Your walks in the morning on the beach is the essence of Buddhism. <laughs> um, and um, it just always hit my brain. So when I met His Holiness, that sort of came back into my head. And, um how did that happen? Um, that was um, a little different. I got I, I was going out with an actress in L.A., and um, she invited me to go see Dalai Lama, who I, re I had heard of peripherally, didn't really know a lot about, but had gotten this tryst on Buddhism years before. And so it really intrigued me. So, yeah, well, yeah. How many years had passed? Probably 10 years. So you were maybe 35 15. at the time? -ish. Yeah, maybe even more. Um, I met His Holiness, I think, in 92. I was born in 45. So, 47-ish. Um, and um, because I was with her, we got taken backstage after the talk. The talk I fell asleep at. <laughs> I didn't understand a lot of it. Um, I still fall asleep when I go see him. I didn't realize that that first time it was because of him that I fell asleep. <laughs> he just takes me to a, this amazing place. And I don't really understand Buddhist. Um, one, once it moves into the, into, um, the practices, I don't, I, I don't know. It's a, um, when I got taken backstage and we were in this holding room, about 40 people. And when he walked in the room, I felt like I had taken the best shower I had ever taken in my life. It felt <laughs> there's a waterfall in Hana that we always say is the rebirth waterfall. And that Did was you how go I, there today? Yeah. Uh. And that was how I felt. I couldn't get in it, though. The water was going too hard. Uh. Um, and that was how I felt. It was just overwhelming. It was the cleanest I had ever felt. My mind, my body. I was, I was like, so clean. And I got to go down the line, and he gave me a scarf. And came back to Maui, and maybe... A week later, went to uh, the bookstore in the days when we still had bookstores. Um, and there was a little paper on the bulletin board, a little Xerox paper that, with his picture. And it said he was coming to the Big Island to do a teaching, in a, like two months later. And um, I said, "Woo! i got to work my way in here. I want to spend some time with him. <laughs> So I thought about it a little bit, and I was involved in the culinary world at that point. So I said, you know, let me, probably he comes to these places, and it's really hard for him to, to really connect in on a really deep level to let me put together a feeding um, that will really show him where he is. Um, let me, you know, get the farmers to be outside his window. Um, so that he, you know, bring the tree, bring the animal, bring the, just not make it so sterile. You know, I, I kept thinking of him in hotel rooms when he could be really, you know, experience what he wanted to experience, which is the human condition. Um, so I, I called up the fellow who had invited us in L.A. It turned out he was named Richard Darlow. He was His Holiness representative. And... Um, they're just beautiful people, the Tibetan people. And no is a very tough word for them. <laughs> so he said yes. And um, I got the opportunity to feed him for three days on the Big Island, which was remarkable. And then I offered my services to travel with him um, when he was traveling outside of India. And um, I, did, I went to Trinidad with him, went to New York with him, did three journeys with him. And in New York, someone showed up who actually knew what I did for a living because they thought I was a cook. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all this time, to be, to be clear, <laughs> you're cooking for him. Yeah. Uh, 
So what's the first thing you make? In, well, it's and were you nervous? <laughs> I was, oh my, nervous. Oh my, well, the one thing was interesting because the only thing they would tell me, I tried to get him to tell me what he likes. Is he a vegetarian? I couldn't get really, whatever you want to cook, what he should be happy with, whatever, you know. Um, so at first I tried to devise it on my own. I, I looked up Tibetan food, and very, very sparse. They have yak. Yak is an animal because it's very mountainous country mm -hmm. and cold country. So they have a yak, which is sort of a cross between a goat and a cow. Um, and they eat yak meat. They make yak stew and yak butter. Out of the yak butter, they have yak tea, which is probably the most classic dish of Tibet is yak tea. Um, so I worked really hard to, oh, so, and I'm sorry. What they did tell me was, they wouldn't tell me what he ate, but they said, you can't have any expectations. And I said, what do you mean by expectations? They said, well, if you or the people helping you think that you're going to meet His Holiness, interact with His Holiness, have a dialogue with His Holiness, you shouldn't do this if that's the reason you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so I had no expectation. So it took all the weight and the nervousness of interacting with them. It sort of became this very pure, you know, service, um, which I really appreciated that they moved me to that space. It's almost like an ingredient. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the most important one yeah. for them. Um, so, um, Anyway, I, 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 when I read all that, I assumed, and then I read that he was a vegetarian when I did some of my research. So I assumed he was a vegetarian, but I worked really hard to get yak butter smuggled into the country. Thinking, Is yak butter illegal? Yeah, he couldn't bring it into the country. Um, and when I had it, I found out it smelled so bad you wouldn't want it in the country. <laughs> but it smelled up my whole house. It was, but it, it really, it was a great lesson for me because I, I kept thinking how cool I was. That I, a, I got my my thought process was. Chicken soup, is a great way to welcome a Jewish person to, to Maui. I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's such a nice thing. I, those moments in my life when, like I'm on tour, and someone's family lives in the town, and you go to the house and they make you the things that they're famous for and that they know make you feel good. So I, that was my thought. So I said, what can I do for him that will make him feel at home? Yak tea. Let him see that we really care about him. We really studied it. It would be like me going to Tibet and them giving me matzo ball soup. Mm. You know? Um, but I, it was, part of it was service, part of it was ego, that he's going to think I'm the coolest guy in the world. This is the cool. I am now the coolest guy in the entire so world. So you did have a little expectation. Yeah, oh, no, 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 very much. It was wild. As much as I tried to get it out. And um, it was a great lesson for me. And uh, But he's he's so aware of everything. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's 5 o'clock in the morning. We have the first meal ready to go. Rinchen comes in and says, please bring His Holiness his breakfast. And I said, but you said I, I, I wasn't going to meet him. Okay. Please, Chef, bring him, bring him his breakfast. So they put a little mask on me. I have a picture on the wall of me bringing him the breakfast in the kitchen. And um, They put a mask on yeah, you? Yeah, they put a mask. You're not supposed to breathe on His Holiness's food. Okay. Um, it's part of the tradition of cooking for Dalai Lamas. Um, so they put this mask on. And I go walking up. And I, I have lots of self-worth issues. Like... I still can't get in front of an audience and do a talk. Mm. I can do a moderated talk. But if I get in front of an audience and do a talk, my armpits get so sweaty. I have these huge, so that I've just never dealt with. I never felt I needed to. It's what it is. So now I'm walking up to bring the Dalai Lama's breakfast. And I can hear the tray rattling. You know, I'm like so nervous, everything's shaking. But in my brain, I'm holding on to how cool I am. That, oh, my God, I'm going to be there when he gets the yak tea. And he's just going to thank me so much for going. This is so, I'm so cool. 
<laughs> I am so cool. <laughs> and I open the door. I knock on the door and I hear, oh, come in. I open the door. He's uh, <laughs> a few steps up. And he's it got his, um, he's in the bathroom brushing his teeth with his robe down. And I come walking in and I can see him. He goes, oh, breakfast. And I said, yes, your holiness. Oh, put it there. Yes, sir. And I can see. And now, now I am the coolest guy in the he's world. He's smelling he's, it. He's smelling it, man. <laughs> it's like I am cool. And he goes, yak tea? <laughs> <sighs> My chest goes out. I get three inches higher. And I say, yes, your holiness. And he goes, oh. And it smells the worst thing you've ever smelled. He goes, <laughs> oh, that's why I leave Tibet. <laughs> <We're> like, <"Oop>, uh, <laughs> that's how did he know? <laughs> how did he know to just? But that's he knows. So he just he he broke the air. He became a human, and he got me right through. So efficiently, <laughs> so efficiently with one sentence, did all those things. Oh no, no, he's amazing. Yeah, yeah. there was like th there's three. Tangents. I want to go on. One is, I had a. I, this is totally unrelated and probably an inappropriate <laughs> tangent. I was once with the. I work with a physical trainer in a gym named Magnus. He's a remarkable guy, and. I would just always. I was like pretty immature client for him at the time. I'd always be going Magnus like. We'd do an exercise, and I'd go, oh, I thought we were going to work hard today, and I'm sort of joking around, talking more than doing anything. And so one day, he's, he puts, like, these four cones, like, in the middle of the gym, and it's a, like a five-by-five five square. And I'm, I'm doing my whole thing, yakking and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and talking and, and you know, uh, distracting from the task at hand and he stands in the middle of this five by five square and he goes five minutes on the clock try to get me out of here and it was like with one movement he was uh, w exercising me but at the same time reestablishing the relationship right. and, and like what needed to go down um, second tangent I was I was thinking, I, I when when you were talking about going to Tibet and being served matzo ball soup, <laughs> I run into that a lot as an artist, especially on tour. If if I'm opening up for another artist, mm -hmm. whether in the past I've opened up for like Justin Bieber or rappers like Fifty Cent. And my first inclination is to totally change what I do to make it more like what they do mm. because that's the audience I'm going to be playing for. And I've learned over the years that that is the, the exact, like, that's the worst thing yeah, I can yeah. do. You got to be you. Exactly. Yeah. It's like no one wants yeah. me to try to do yeah. an impression of 50 Cent right. or an impression of Justin Bieber. They want me to do the best version of, of what me. you do. Yeah. But and that's a good lesson to learn. That a yeah. lot of people never learn that lesson. So. And the third tangent was I was just reminded I had uh, Sharon Salzberg on the podcast, and she was talking about the first time she met the Dalai Lama and she said he has a, a spidey sense for finding the person who needs him the most in the room and that sh that he's just attracted to them and he knows the right thing to say uh. and it's like a an art to it a real no, no, no. I I I have seen it so clearly that it's just remarkable it's a story that I I I'll leave out the first part of the story because I don't ever tell it. But I was in a situation with His Holiness where I had a grandfather whose granddaughter was diagnosed with a deadly disease. She was two and a half. They were very poor. I was doing an event with His Holiness. 
I got this beautiful letter from the grandfather saying that he had a dream that if his, if his holiness touched his granddaughter, it would save her. Um, and that he didn't have resources. Um, that we, I was doing an event with his holiness here in Maui. And for a variety of reasons, I couldn't get permission for that girl to get near his holiness. Um, but I wasn't going to let it go because I know that's the moment, that's what he's about. Whether he can help or not, it doesn't matter. It's, but that's what he's, when someone reaches out with that kind of pain. Um, so I didn't let it go. And I was taking him to the stage to do a performance here. And I said to the people who told me they couldn't meet this girl, that it's a Hawaiian custom I turned, I, they, he had two handlers with him. I turned to them, so I couldn't see him. And I said, listen, I have a girl at the side of the, st at the corner of the stage. It's a Hawaiian custom. No one can go and speak unless they get blessed by a girl first. And they said, oh, good, no problem. We take him over. So I turned back out of a crowd of 150 people at the steps to the stage. He was already embracing her in his arms, had the girl in his arms. So you're saying he, we, there was a huge amount of people and he was able to single her out? Oh, like holding her. And I got a note from the grandfather because two years later his holiness came back asking if he could bring his granddaughter. She, she lived. Come on. I swear. Come I, on. I didn't answer his letter because I would have had to deal with the same people to get her through <laughs> and I wasn't doing this event <laughs> so there was no way I was going to get it right <laughs> what do you think of that that scheme it's a Hawaiian custom uh, schemes maybe a strong word uh, but I think cause it's a it's a very sweet scheme <laughs> I, I you know I is I that could be is I that could be in the moment yeah I could be completely wrong but I've never had a pri problem rearranging the truth if it doesn't hurt anybody and really help somebody. Mm. Um, I, it's the way I've made my living, um, but not for the same reasons, but that's what I do for artists. It's that same, you know, you, you create what you want to have happen. You don't wait for it. So you create history. So for me, there was no way in the world that His Holiness was not going to meet this girl because I know that's, that would be the, that's the most important reason he kills anywhere is for those moments mm -hmm. that's 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 the moment when someone is in that, you know that much pain and reaches out and i mean that's that's what he lives for he doesn't live to get on the planes and go do the speeches and those he lives for that moment so um for me it was wasn't even a question i it, i i didn't think for one second about the lie to me it was not even it wasn't didn't even come into my realm of thought i i must say and i don't want to get political um i see trump doing what i did in some ways and it sort of takes it just kills me to see someone manipulating the truth to those ends but it also makes me realize that what i did was a dangerous you know it definitely was a wand. You know, I, I made up a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, I guess it's in the, uh, in some ways arrogant, in other ways, you know, for me to, to condone twisting the truth to my own self-interest. But um, in a case like that, I'm happy I did it. I would do it again every single time. Yeah. Not even a question. You know? What do you think is that when when Roger walks in that room and the first time you see the Dalai Lama, what do you think is actually happening when you have that feeling of I took the best shower of my life? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. And we spoke a little yeah, that's bit a about great, It's that. a great question. I don't, I've never been though, um... I'm basically a knee-jerk reaction guy, uh, much more so than a deep thinker, go A to B to C because of a deep thought. 
Um, mm. I'm much more of a knee jerk kind of reaction guy. I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, I think what I'm hearing is it, it de- to you, it doesn't so much matter what's happening. Yeah, yeah. it's happening. Yeah, it's and happening. That's what's exactly. important. Yeah, that's the part that's important. I'm a so the opposite. I have to understand everything. Right. Yeah, I don't <laughs> to a to a fault sometimes. Yeah. yeah, I'm completely the other way. Yeah, completely the other. I am, I know especially the big stuff because I know I'll never know the answers. So I just do what I think is right and what feels good and what I think mm. in that moment is the right thing to do. And mm. um, I try and really watch this. this my 360 degree circle that what I'm doing isn't hurting anyone. Um, and then I sort of feel like I can do it. Yeah. You know, um, so the, when you say for his holiness, that's what he's living for, to, for those moments. What are you living for? And sometimes um, I phrase, you know, that I, I don't really know what I'm living for. I mean, I, I've seen when I look back on my life, I, I had a, I had a um, a real epiphany writing my book, um, which was that I my, I had a father who I loved uh, more than anything, um, in the way you can only love your parents. You know, I mean, I love my father, but I always thought of him as a very weak man. I always I loved him with sympathy. Um, he all he did was go to work got the, on the train in the morning, came home late at night, had no friends, didn't really drink. My mother was a very difficult lady, always putting him down, um, very rarely talked, didn't drive a car. Um, and I always thought of him as this very weak man who I loved so much. Um, and when I was writing the book, what, what really hit me was that he was probably the strongest man I've ever been around in my life. Well, after he passed away, I found all this stuff that he was a handball champion, that he house on a house on Fire Island with three other bachelors. Um, he was the publisher of his college newspaper. These were all things I knew nothing. I thought that he really just lived this. And I realized when I was writing the book, he completely gave up everything he loved in life to raise me everything like everything um he was the strong the strongest human i've ever been around in my life he gave up everything um so for me when i i I, that's a long way to get around to that question when i look back at my life i see that i i fulfilled part of that legacy of him you know that when I look back at my life the things that I've really enjoyed are being of service you know feeding people in my house uh, getting people their dreams Um, you know that's what I always say to a client give me give me a dream let me bring a dream to life then we don't need contracts we don't need to talk all the time you'll know who I am Um, and we just go on so when I look back, I realize I probably am living my father's life, but with um, on a much more public stage and arena. Mm. Um, but I, I, I don't, I don't live up to his thing. But I'm, that's definitely service is what has always made me happy. Um, I just, uh, I almost started talking to you about this before we were. Recording, um, but what you said really resonates with me. I part of the reason I'm here is because my father passed away January this year, mm-hmm. and one of the gifts of his passing away, of course, I miss him. But one of the gifts, and there's several gifts that I got from it. I'm sure I'll get more was that I was reminded of my own mortality. And we talked a little bit earlier about Ram Dass, uh-huh. and I, I've, I've listened to a lot of Ram Dass's lectures and read some of his writing. 
And I thought, well, why don't I go to him? Absolutely, <laughs> man. That's it. Yeah. And so it was, it, it sounds stupid, but it, my father had to pass for me to get uh-huh. there in my own head. And there were several of things on that list that I was sort of putting off for one day. And that was one of the reasons that I'm, I'm on Maui right now. And furthermore, I sort of teared up a, a little bit yeah, when we were beautiful. speaking yeah. because I, I just, re- I, it was, I had this very similar experience w- of loving dad with sympathy uh-huh. where my mother, same thing, was, was hard on dad. Uh-huh. And God bless her. I love my mom yeah, to I death. Would, yeah. And I would say that in front of her. She, yeah. But she, <laughs> she had temper on her. You know, still does sometimes. Um, and I never, I never thought I had anything in common with my father. Yeah. Because he would sit in his backyard in the suburbs of Detroit. Kind of like we are now. So he mm-hmm. wasn't looking at this beautiful ocean but he'd be looking at oh, his beautiful his suburbs of detroit were beautiful his little backyard i lived in pontiac so oh I wow know. what yeah. okay well <laughs> we'll get into that and so he and he i remember him telling me he was getting ready re- ready to retire i said what i said what are your goals now and he goes i think i don't really have any because i have every everything and i remember this experience of i had sort of like Got my first record deal and same thing. I didn't have the cocaine spoon, right. but That's I was, yeah, yeah. I was, you know, riding high on my own. And he got to see that, which success. is so great. Yeah. It was. Uh-huh. And I was back in town for a wedding and I needed a belt. I think I forgot a belt. So my dad went with me to some store and I was buying a belt and they had these like overpriced Ugg slippers there. And I thought, you know, I'm going to be a big shot. I'm going to buy my dad these Ugg slippers. I go, Dad, try these on. Don't worry. It's on me. And he looks at me so confused. He goes, I have slippers. I have my clogs. <laughs> and he would wear these old, like, like soccer sandals that he'd had for 15 years, and they're falling apart. But he, just di- he didn't want those Uggs at all. He was all. happy he raised you. And he... He didn't seem to really want anything, Mm -hmm. which was so kind of absurd to me because I wanted Mm -hmm. to take over the world. No, no, I got it. I was right in the same place. And so I and and he really he died with me feeling like I I didn't have much in common with him. I loved him to death. Same thing with me. I'm absolutely the same. Yeah. And took me writing a book to realize that I'm living his life. Yeah, and and especially you met my love Megan, who's here, who I I've been in a relationship with since my dad passing away, and I am like totally like him, and I'm totally him. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? It's it's yeah. wild, and yeah. I have so much in common with him. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story of of when it kind of hit me was. My dad was overweight uh, for all the all of my life, and it used to bother me when I was younger. And I would give him a hard time about it, and I sort of have like a uh, had like a unsaid, and maybe I still do. I probably still do, unsaid contract with myself that I would never be overweight, mm-hmm. and. The end of last year, this got like out of control where I was, I was losing weight really fast and I was eating every other day. Uh, And so I'm doing this like weird fasting diet and I'm very calculated and at his funeral, I was fasting that day. Even like that, I was still going to stick to my like regimented diet. And so I'm at his funeral, I'm fasted, and his best friend is giving the eulogy, and she says, 
<laughs> she gave the best eulogy ever. <laughs> and but one part of it was she, she goes, and Johnny, when he was younger, before I knew him, before I was born, he used to do these weird diets. He would not eat for a whole day, and then he'd eat a bunch well, the next day. And I go, oh my oh gosh! Yeah. In my effort to not be like him, I am being exactly, exactly like, like him. him. Yeah. And it was a real, it was a real eye opener. And and some of the, so yeah, I think some of the things. Well, I'm hesitant. I do believe like we can be who we want to be. Mm-hmm. And change things about ourselves if we want to. Um, there is a there is a degree of things that we inherit. Oh, I and, think so. And, it's uh, amazing. Yeah, a lot of them are really uh, great. And it there's a it's kind of a, as I'm speaking, I'm kind of like a more cognizant of me. Like you were saying about the home, it's not so much like I'm doing my life. It's almost like carrying on a a lineage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we're lucky coconuts. What uh, is let's talk about death. Yeah, I, I um I talk it a lot when I I've been doing since the movie I've been doing a lot of uh, moderated conversations. Uh-huh. And I try and uh, it's usually younger people who are trying to find a path and I j- you say you're going to die. Just you are going to die. You got to make the middle what you want don't be scared to fail fail or success you are going to die so fill those moments up so for me I, my thought of death is um, I would just like it to come fast um, I've seen so many people I love go through so much pain um, and their families go through such pain um, that um that that for me that's if i have uh if i have a a coupon with whoever's controlling this place mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be my use of the coupon um i i always um i was very flippant about death as a young man um i always would say when my friends would, uh, someone they loved died, I'd always say, you know, the only, if you really believe that somebody created this, whether it's, you know, if you're a Jew, whatever you are, if you believe in a bigger something, um, the only two things that every person on this planet gets is they're born and they die. And if this guy is actually, in, whoever the, that force is that's in control, mm-hmm. it's got to be a gift. Or, you get, or you, Can this by, guy be so evil that the only things that he gives us are bad? That was what I would say to people to try and make them think more positively about a loved one dying. Until the doctor told me that I had clogged arteries and I probably was going to die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then all that changed, <laughs> and I got scared to death. Mm-hmm. And your my own mortality overtook everything in my body. Waves of fear and anxiety, waves. Um, and I got through that one. Then I got told I had cancer. And the waves came, but not as bad. I was more. I was able to deal with it more with my head than with emotion. But then I had a. Uh, near, I, I, uh, I flatlined twice when I had my last little problem. And when I woke up out of that one, I was sort of a different person. Um, How old were you then? Just, uh, this was about seven years ago, eight years ago. And um, I woke up, I was just the calmest I had ever been in my life. Like a different kind of calm. It didn't last long. It lasted maybe four days. But it was a peace and a calm like I had never, ever experienced before. So it's it sort of taken the edge off of me of, um, compl- of di- at least in my brain. I don't know what will happen if I, if I face it again. Because when you face it, that mm-hmm. moment of mortality is pretty wild. Um, 
But one, I, I know that I'll never know what really happens. So I try and make up stories to make me feel good. <laughs> Do you, I feel the exact same way. I have my my little theory, yeah. but I know I have no idea. Yeah. So big. Yeah. Yeah. What? So is there? You described it a, a little bit as waves of fear and anxiety. Mm-hmm. What's the real difference between? Because I think, at my age, it's it's more of a concept. Right. Right. And obviously, like I understand with uh-huh. my head, I'm gonna die. Right. But I don't know if I yeah. really understand. When that I'm moment comes, die. if there's a moment, everyone I've talked to, all my friends who get to that point, you know, where something happens, where a doctor says to them, you know, you have cancer, your arteries block, um, you have this, you have that, you have. Look. There's that moment where you just go look in the mirror, and it you melt away. It's just these waves. I don't know how to describe it, but everybody sort of gets the same thing. You get these waves of fear and anxiety. It's it's so primal Mm. um, that I think it goes way beyond anything I could even rationalize. But the 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 primal instinct to survive is so strong that it overtakes all the Buddhist books you read (laughs) and all all that stuff. It just takes over. It is. Such it comes a from this deep place. That's yeah. It's such a difference, um, and it's funny that we're 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 recording a podcast now. But I'm like a serial learner. Like I'll fix this problem by learning more, uh-huh. um, or I will make my life better by learning more. But there's a huge difference between knowing something and living it. Yeah. And it sounds so like yeah. obvious to say that, but I had the, I had the, like I remember for years been telling like talking about mindfulness and being present, and like I knew I understood that, and I, I don't think I really lived it until like a few moments this year, mm-hmm. where I dropped like there were some things that happened in my life where I dropped in and I was like whoa, I'm actually like here. <laughs> this is my life right now <laughs> on the couch talking to Shep. That's it. All the work I've done has gotten me to this. This is what I have to show for it. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's it. And all the times before where I've been talking about being present, I never really was. Mm-hmm. I just knew it with my head. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't know. A lot of those words are difficult words too. Present is like a difficult word, <laughs> you know, because you don't. Um, I, I think everybody uses it. Trendy word, yeah, too. and I think everybody uses a different. Way. I, I like the comfortable in your skin thought. Mm. Um, that, that if you get to a place where you're comfortable in your skin, um, that that's a great place to be, and and you sort of, you can feel it when you are, you know. I think at least I can. Yeah. Um, you know, I I know um when I travel, when I leave here and I have to deal with stuff, I become a little different in my skin. I I actually had a weird thing cuz I always said people would say why Maui? You know, you're such a young guy, you had a great career. Why did you go to Maui? How old were you when you moved to Maui? Uh, I got here 43 years ago, so I was 29. Wow. Um, and I'm 29 now. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I said... <laughs> and by the way, but <laughs> within uh, within 10 minutes of being at home, think, uh, was thinking about moving. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. Come on, we got room. <laughs> but um, I would always say, I just feel different in my skin. I, and I would try and find reasons to describe it. I, the youngest planet, the youngest landmass on the planet... So it's like a baby, you know, it smells sweet, it, weather. But I'd always come back to comfortable in my skin, and people would say, what does that mean? And i say, I don't really know. But I just feel, I'm like comfortable in my skin. And um, when I had my, uh, my heart problems, they made me monitor my blood pressure every day. And my blood pressure in Maui is 20 degrees lower than it is in LA 
So I actually go to the airport. There was a time when I went to the airport, took my blood pressure because my doctors didn't believe it. Got on the plane, went to L.A., taken in L.A. airport. Mm. And I go from perfect to dangerous <laughs> just on the plane ride. Jeez. And I take now a blood pressure pill when I'm on the mainland. And here I have to take salt to get my blood pressure up sometimes. Wow. It's that big a difference. There are times it'll be 30, 40 point difference. So I really, truly am different in my skin. Mm. And it made me, made me think, and I have no idea if this is true or not true, but um, we are, we're all so far removed from the land that's part of the circle of life that maybe I have some connection somewhere to this piece of, to this land, to this area, to this something. Um, Cause I just feel different in my skin and I actually am. And I don't know how to explain it. It's bizarre. You know, it, it was just words till my blood pressure. Um, so I don't know if it's my brain driving my body. I don't know if it's my body driving my brain. Wow. Um, but I know for me, I just feel so blessed that yeah. I found this place. I could sort of feel yeah. that. Yeah, just when you were wa- we were walking around the side of your home, and I, I said I feel like a weight coming off. Yeah, yeah. I, I do feel that. A lot of people. A lot and of I people. Noticed coming the, I noticed walking with you, like your steps were a little slower yeah. than I was like <laughs> a rush. I'm like, okay, let's go into Maui mode now, Mike. We can walk a little slower, <laughs> now, you know, and it's true. It's it's. But I think you know, there's probably people in the mountains who do the same, and mm-hmm. there's people, you know, I know New Yorkers who can't leave New York. They get become really uncomfortable in their skin, and they're comfortable in there. So I think a lot of it is where you know, I think of it like plugging in your iPhone. You know, if you can find the place to charge, this is for me like the charge for my iPhone as a human. Yeah. Um, just really works. Uh, we have a beautiful sunset. I wish you all could see it. <laughs> it's just pretty remarkable. <laughs> pretty remarkable. <laughs> Would you say that the percentage of, like you said, when you move, go to L.A., you feel a little different in your skin? As you've gone through your life, has the percentage of time that you feel comfortable in your own skin in gone up? Are you comfortable in your yeah, skin I would more? Say, yeah, I would say much more, particularly um, since I gave up my office and um, hitting a lot of balls at the same time. Mm. Um, so I think um, I've definitely become much more comfortable. I was, uh, my, you know, when, you, when you're a manager, what you don't, one of the things that if you're going to do it properly is you're taking on a person's life. That's a huge responsibility. That's like, forget about the career, the life. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and they only have one life. I was managing 35 artists. So I, if I wanted to be flippant, I could move from one to the other. But those were 35 lives and children and mothers and people. And... Um, I didn't have time to get comfortable in my skin. I was, I had to really be on their journey. So my journey was one of service to their journeys. Um, it's when I come here that I start, I deal a little bit with my journey. Mm. Um, and that makes me really comfortable. Wow. And, um, but so, so it's really been the last 10 or 12 years since I, all I do now really is Alice. He's the only responsibility I have, and my children. Um, and that's gigantic. I mean, that's, whew, you got 20, 30 lives on your hands. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> from, <laughs> from the other end, as an artist, like, I can't, I know how, I don't know. I have an idea of how much responsibility it is to be my manager. Yeah, it's exactly. a lot. No, it's okay. a lot. Man. <laughs> it's a yeah. my manager Ryan, who is incredible guy Ryan Chisholm. But 
Ew, I'm calling that guy all yeah. the time. I don't think it, people don't realize what a team game. Um, being a professional musician or, you know, a, a, any profession in the arts is a team game. Yes. And um, really, and people you're surrounded with, both in terms of su- the success and the quality of the success, and the um, the consequences to the rest of the people of the success. There's so many parts of it that um, come into play that it's a team game. And, um, you know, at the things that, that the public don't think about and is every employee of a, of a musician that you like is a representative of that person. So you're not only managing the person, you have to make sure that anybody who touches that circle gets what they should be getting, not human stuff, because most humans are difficult. Mm-hmm. So depending on who the artist is, I mean, I, I did deal with some artists who didn't want to share any aloha. Um, didn't want to share any what? Any aloha. Yeah. You know, wouldn't do signatures, wouldn't do autographs, wouldn't do... Um, didn't... Um, Have but, days like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was lucky because most of my artists, like, really, you know, I really could get across the fact that the time to get hassled is when they don't want your autograph. The time to get upset is when no one's running after you to take a picture. Right. Yeah. That's the moment. When they come up to you to ask for something, oh my God, just embrace it. Yeah. Because that's what's, that's what it's about. Totally. That's, you know, that's what's giving you everything. Um, so, um, and sometimes you get what you wish for, and that would be, the, you know, which is nobody caring. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> what, to an artist, this question is really me, okay? So I'm going to say, like, for an artist who's two albums in, working on their third, who is me, we got to just start the question. Yeah, right. What <laughs> advice do you have for me? I, I, I. Not knowing you till today, not really experiencing your art, but having um, s- looked from a distance at the path of your journey, I am overwhelmed by how far you've gotten in such a short distance. I think that um, the, the journey of your podcast is so fantastic. Uh, for me, as an older guy mm. who um, is really scared about what's going to happen to our planet. Like, I'm really scared. Mm. You know, I have a granddaughter who I, I, I have my, I have four adopted children. They're Afro-American. One of them works on the road with Alice Cooper. And she called me about three months ago, right after that Charlottesville thing happened. And... Um, was crying said I'm really scared Alice is playing Virginia I'm scared to go to Virginia and that's a girl of privilege who's been around you know so I see that and I say our world is in trouble we are in serious trouble and then I see young people like you who um, I think one of the problems of my generation was that we sold truth we had our, our spiritual leaders, um, our guru types, were people who sold answers, not questions. Mm. You know, walk on the fire pit and you'll be a rich, happy person. You'll be married for your whole life. Um, those kind of, you know, mm. pay me money and I'll give you the answer. And um, I started to see with people like Tim Ferriss, a different approach to knowledge and to life. But when I read your thing, I said, wow, this is how great that you would be getting, as a young man, all these acclimates about how great you are. I'm sure, because you had hit records, so everybody tells you how great you are. Mm -hmm. And that you wanted to actually explore what's life all about. Um, And you're doing it. 
So I think you're on exactly the the perfect path, and I think if it's what we need. This place is. I mean, we we're this was a tough time. This is a really tough time. When I saw. Thank you. On that Charlottesville thing, the faces of the white supremacists, that these were young white people who I interact with in, you know, supermarkets. And these weren't like 60-year-old people without teeth weighing 400 pounds. Mm-hmm. I say, oh, we, we're in trouble. And then I see guys like you, and I hope that you can overtip them because it's... it's it's wild out there. So I, I, I'm thrilled to be here today with you because I love people who know that they're never going to find out the answer and continue the journey to get the answer. Thank you. Um, and that you got there at this young age is remarkable. Thank you. And from Detroit. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had this, uh, my, one of my mentors, he since passed away. He was my, start off my piano teacher. His name was Norman Mamie. And he said, and he said, what does Michael mean? I said, I don't know. I'm like 26 at the time. He said, you should look up what your name means. And so I Googled it. And I find out Michael is a question. Really? Oh, it's that's a great. question. The question is, who is God? And I go, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like no, that's no, that's I'm, cool, yeah. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. I yeah. asked my mom, I said, you know that? She said, no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, no, but that's. I think that's the biggest difference I've seen and the biggest positive difference I've seen. The biggest hope is a generation of people who aren't, and this is maybe too cold a word to say snake oil, but, you know, I, my generation of people were people selling for a lot of money answers mm. instead of questions. And that was dangerous, you know, uh, dangerous stuff. I mean, you, you can see the fabric today. So it's just, you know, I, I, when I first, when my documentary came out and I first went and talked, I went to five or six of those kind of things where they charge a lot of money, mm. a lot of, um, a lot of divorced, very wealthy women um, looking for love, uh, which we all are. Um, and, you know, people playing right into it. And um, it really depressed me. It was like, oh, my God, is this where we've come? And then then I met a guy in Canada, and he turned me on to, um, I think, Jordan Harbinger was the first one. And then Tim Ferriss, and then a couple others. And I started, and then I started to meet these people. Mark Who was Moran. the first one? Jordan? Jordan Harbinger. I never yeah, heard of him. Yeah, those are really nice pod. One of the, another one of those searchers. Is he has a podcast? Yeah, yeah, very Check successful. I think he very successful. And Tim Ferriss, by the way, I'll just say I love, yeah, love, love, his love stuff. Him. Yeah, great. Um, so you know that I think that's the hope for the future is is knowing we'll never know, but searching mm -hmm. for the answer. The interesting, like with the with the selling answers thing, it's interesting because I've I've I don't know how to I've been trying to articulate this thought for a while, and I don't, I don't know if I'll get it here, but I'll try. It feels to me as if everyone, the people listening to us, you, I, every single person is doing the best they can to make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. And each of us has adopted some viewpoint or lens through which to look at reality mm -hmm. to help us get through life. And for some people, that's a religion. Right. And for others, it's sort of something they've yeah. they piecemealed together yeah. like myself there are, are moral crutches yeah <laughs> and they are yeah they, i would say there are life crutches right, life, there's life, a way yeah. for people to get through life right. um and i think yeah i think the trouble is when people think that their life crutch is the most beautiful crutch in right. the world and everyone else's crutch is And pay trash. me and I'll get you one. Yeah, pay yeah. me and I'll yeah. I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you'll be able to walk faster. Yeah, then you'll be able to walk faster. <laughs> exactly. You'll be able to throw away your crutches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, 
There's one qu- I, I, I'm very interested to ask you. I have two more questions for you. First is, being a father, a white man, who is a father to black children, for me, I actually thought about this before in my own life, and it seems like I w- would be unqualified. <laughs> how do you how how do you guide someone through something that you haven't gone through? Yeah, I think I was completely unqualified. Also, um, I I. Um, I had a very strange relationship with the kids because um, I wasn't I wasn't emotionally involved. Um, I it was one, I, everything I do is a knee jerk reaction, basically. And um, I was at a funeral. They were there. They were going to be split up to foster homes, and I just. In the in the never even thinking about what it actually meant, I said, "Hey, you can't split these kids up." And uh, I said, "I'll I'll pay for it." If if I went to the grandmother and the great grandmother, I said, "I'll buy you a house. I'll pay for it. Um, if you guys will raise the kids, I'm in till they're 18, then I'm gone. Um, but let's give them a life." So we didn't. I didn't meet the kids for the first year. Mm. I didn't. I didn't even go to meet them. And then I got really guilty because I thought of myself as a checkbook. Never had a lot of self-worth, so I didn't think I had a lot to really give them. Mm. Um, and then when I went and I met them and I started to build a relationship, the relationship was sort of a long-distance relationship. So I would come, they would come out here for the summers. Um, but I never took parental responsibility until... Um, one of the kids asked if they could come to school here, eighth grade. Then they all started to come to school. But by then they had sort of formulated in a way who they were. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, even to this day, I never felt the the moral authority to do things that maybe a parent would actually do. Mm. Um, and I love them. And, you know, the three of them are back here on the island. One lives with me. Um but we're more like friends than parenting. Mm-hmm. The grandmother and the great grandmother really do the parenting. Um, I I would say it's the thing I probably have done the the least well in my life mm-hmm. is parenting. I think a lot of parents feel that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so, um, but we love each other and we've had a great time. And I think every family has that weird dynamic. Had they was there ever so one of them comes eighth grade do they encounter racism yeah, in their childhood a little like bit not bad i mean i don't and what how do you yeah, deal with that um I just laughed my way through it um we just laughed about it we would just laugh you know we'd we'd actually we worked at we'd check into motels and you know, really make sure that the clerk saw us because we don't go in one room. <laughs> so here's this old Jewish guy <laughs> and all these black kids <laughs> way before. Um, so that they, they didn't, you know, we had some prejudice. I can't say that I felt a lot. Um, the kids were upstate New York in a place called Monroe, which was basically black and Hasidic uh-huh. and some white. When they came here, there there's no real blacks here. She was the only black student at the school. Um, so it wasn't even prejudice because where we'd get the most of it is on the road when we travel. People would see me, especially as they got older, see us check in the rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, we never really we never really dealt with it. Um, we just laughed a lot. So. Last question. You can cook, if you can cook, if you could cook, a meal for anyone, dead or alive, who would it be, and what would you make them? Um, I would love to cook another meal for Mr. Berger, and um, I would make him uh, two or three of his dishes that I think I do well with, the chicken cacciatore 
a, a stuffed squash uh, zucchini flour. And I'd bake some garlic and have it on French bread. But I'd love to make him a meal. I've cooked with him. I never actually made him a meal. Mm. Or, um, but I've cooked with him. So I would say he would be... Um, I still think about him every day. He still pops into my daily routine um, all the time. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, man. It was amazing. Let's go have a good meal. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs>